Well, good evening and welcome to Down the Road with Joel Heidkamp. Joel out again today. I'm Tyler Axon is filling in. I'll take you all the way into your evening programming here on Beck TV. A lot of news happened since I was with you yesterday and we'll get all into that. We are going to continue our conversation about the drought conditions. Rusty Halverson, he's an ag reporter with KFGO Radio out in Fargo, a co-worker of mine. Uh, he's going to be breaking down what are the, some of the programs are, federally, state, and what neighbors are doing to help neighbors. That's going to be coming up later on. Also, pheasants, game and fish, if you didn't win the lottery the north dakota deer gun lottery that is you didn't get your tag there's plenty available we'll tell you about how you can go and apply and hopefully get a deer tag this year and then fill that user up a little bit later on but before all that i think the big news across north dakota happened yesterday afternoon when the state board of higher education met behind closed doors and uh, once they opened those doors up to the public the chair of the State Board of Higher Education, Nick Hacker, said uh, President Dean Brashani of NDSU will be president for just about one more year. And then uh, he will be uh, transitioned, as they're putting it, stepping down is the terminology they're using, uh, to be a tenured professor at NDSU. I think there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm going to give you my thoughts on it as a former state senator that worked on budgets, worked with NDSU and all the State Board of Higher Education. But before all that, the, the terminology of stepping down, a transition, not a firing, not a non-renewal of contract. It makes me wonder for you as taxpayers, you as parents of students that might be at NDSU, or if you are a student that's paying tuition, what that means for your pocketbook if, in fact, this wording, what it means long-term for benefits compensation for Dean Bershon. Here to break that down for me is... Uh, Ross Nielsen, he's with the Nielsen Brand Law Firm and is very specialized in this very type of work. And Ross, I appreciate you taking time because terminology, you know, I mean, it means a lot, especially when it comes to benefits laws, and that's what your profession is. Uh, the announcement yesterday from Nick Hacker was that uh, this was a transition and that uh, Dean Bershani agreed to step down. I'm curious, you as an attorney, what does that mean to you? Well, first, thanks for having me. Um, I think sometimes with attorneys especially when someone has a employment contract and you're talking about renewing or not renewing um, there's like coded terminology right stepping down transitioning those are all kind of terms that um, is used sometimes when there's been some kind of agreement where neither party is happy and they're trying to figure out a way to move forward and so when i saw the news yesterday and kind of some of the reports coming out today to me, it seems like maybe there's a little bit of, of back and forth going. Um, will we ever know all that went down? Probably not because they did it in executive session and mm -hmm. we're never going to know the full details for sure. Yeah, those uh, uh, the, the ne contract negotiations I was away from public eyes and I agree or disagree as far as transparency goes. I think you're right. We won't know the details. What are some of the options? I mean, the fact that transitioning from a presidency uh, to a tenured professor at the same university. Uh, I mean, to me, that seems, okay, that, that's an agreement. Benefits, the, the ultimate question, I think, is what I'm going to be building up to, and I can just cut to the chase here. We have seen right here in North Dakota, former State Board of Higher Education uh, chancellors get golden parachutes, uh, multi-million dollars to say, all right, well, you know what, you just, just go, just get away. We've seen it from former UND presidents that went on down to Colorado that are no longer there. They yep. got to millions of dollars to just go away. Yep. That's not really the case here, but are they finding some middle ground? Is there a golden parachute waiting for Dean Bershani is what I'm asking. Well, it sounds like that at least with him leaving through until or being on hand, I guess, until December 2022, 20, uh, that he's going to get his full salary and then prorated to the, the time frame. He gets tenure, which is always an advantage, mm -hmm. uh, becoming a tenured uh, professor. And my guess would be is that there are definitely some benefits that he's getting in, in agreeing to this. Uh, one thing I found interesting was is that they, uh, when asked whether it was a take it or leave it situation, they said that he uh, had input into it, which to me says that maybe the board was considering taking a more drastic action and didn't want to do it. And part of the other thinking is, for, especially for a board, is how ugly do you want it to get? If the board was leaning towards not renewing him, um, that can get ugly because maybe he can challenge it. And the next thing you know, you've got headlines and you're spending money on attorneys. And that's not a good look for anybody at that right. point, especially the board. But I do think that there definitely is probably some golden parachute um, going on here and at least having a nice, soft landing spot becoming a tenured professor. 
Well, and I was visiting with some of the people that were involved with higher education. They, they did take note of that yesterday, saying, well, you know, he's going to be a tenured professor, and that's one of those coveted positions in, in higher education. So it's not as though there's a lot of sympathy, you know, for the situation. I mean, yes, you have a little bit because, I, I mean, Dean Bershani has been a part of the community, part of NDSU for 12 years now, or will be 12 years uh, by the time he's done. I'm going to get into how we got here over those 12 years because I've been involved with some of that. Uh, but let's say, okay, he accepted that offer. I mean, is that going to be ironclad that, okay, well, you will be here, obviously, until June 2022. Then you will be a tenured professor. That's how we achieve this? Or does he still have options, do you assume? I know we don't have the hard copy of the meeting minutes here. Uh, just, I mean, is this pretty locked into where, all right, well, this is what how it's going to go, or does he still have options to... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think this, this was a situation where Dean Briscani came into the meeting yesterday and there was no discussion beforehand and they were all just surprised that this was happening. Yeah, I, I, oh, I'm going to get into that because yeah. there were some phone calls over the weekend. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm sure there was. And so I don't I think that this was a negotiated type of deal where both parties are trying to figure out a way to get out of it. I know, and, and it sounds like you're going to get into a little bit more. He was put on a uh, performance improvement plan. It's, it's PIP for short, but it's pretty standard, um, especially when someone isn't meeting the goals that you want. And there had been criticism of Dean Briscoe and some of the things that he was handling in that the board put him on this performance improvement plan. Um, and it sounds like he wasn't meeting some of those goals. And we don't know exactly what the board was thinking because it was in that executive session. And I think that maybe there was discussions beforehand and they figured out a way out of this that both parties could maybe leave without having all the egg on their face. Severance when it comes to higher education. I mean, these are these are paid through tuition. It's paid through for uh, tax dollars. I mean, I've always had an issue, and when I bring it up on my radio show about uh, other moments, I mean, Hamid Trevani, for example, got, you know, he was a chancellor uh, for the higher education system here for, uh, you know, just a short time, and he ended up with multi-million dollars to basically go back to California. It wasn't working out. The board was warned before they hired him that it wasn't going to work out. I mean, the, the the severance of higher education, I don't really know how I'm going to get to the question here, but is it something that we should reevaluate? Because I think about other situations to where, you know what, if there's something going on at a place of employment, you're not necessarily getting the exuberant amount of dollars to basically just go away. I mean, why is this standard for, say, higher education or those top-tier officials to where, all right, well, I'll leave, but here's what I need? Well, I think part of it is a balancing act, right? I think the goal is let's get the best candidate that we can. And if it's a good candidate, you're not going to be the only, you know, dance partner, so to speak. So you got to sometimes sweeten that pot in order to get the people that you want. And let's just be honest. North Dakota is a number one on the you know vacation destination list and, and things like that. So some so sometimes it can take a little bit more to get people to come here. So some of that comes down to we want to get good candidates. What are we going to have to do? And maybe you might have to do something a little bit more than someplace like California or New York or somewhere where it might be more desirable in order to get people to come here. And sometimes you enter into those contract negotiations and you agree to things that ultimately results in someone like you said getting multi-million dollars to, to go away. And the other part of it is, okay, we don't like this guy, we need to get rid of him, but this is what the contract says. And if we try to force him out or try to fire him or do whatever, he could sue us for breach of contract and maybe some other unknown claims that we don't know about. What is the balancing act before, between how much are we going to have to pay him, how much you know, might we be on the hook for if we go through this litigation? And at the end of the day, how much do we have to pay our attorneys? So those are all factors. I don't see that go smiling when you said pay yeah. the attorneys on that. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, at, at the end of the day, uh -huh. you know, in my line of work, it all comes down to for a lot of people, um, how much is this going to cost? And we always try to tell people, what's this is what your best day is. This is what your worst day is. What's somewhere in between? So that could be something coming, you know, factoring in when you reach some kind of negotiated settlement or asking somebody to leave and, you know, transition and do all these things is what's the best day, what's the worst day. And also the other factor is for, for these kind of, you know, the Board of Higher Education, they've got public relations to deal with too. I mean, they've made a series of mistakes in the mm -hmm. past and they don't want to have a repeat of that again. So they've got to factor that in too. 
Uh, final question I have for you, because we are dealing with tax dollars, we're dealing with tuition versus, you know, a, a private company that's dealing with profits here. Uh, as far as these negotiations, uh, these ability to pay somebody to just go away, is it more lax? I mean, are we more, well, it's tax dollars, you know, we'll just, you know, we'll get more the next time the tax bill comes due. Or is it more willing to just pay out through tax in this public side or private? Is there really a discrepancy between the two? I'm just curious. I don't know if it's necessarily a discrepancy between the two. I think that, like you said, sometimes it might be easier to say, well, this is tax dollars. We can always go back to the, yeah. the piggy bank, so to speak, than a company or, or a uh, other institution that might have not have those kind of funds. Um, I think what it comes down to is, is that what are we comfortable with in making this go away? And how is it not going to be ugly? And yeah, we might have to spend some more money, and yeah, we might have to go back to the taxpayers, but is it better than having a big, ugly stink of everything and having to pay attorneys and possibly having to pay Dean Briscani a lot of money for how this was handled? So it's it's a balancing act. It's not a perfect science. Yeah. We know, especially with attorneys, it's, it's sometimes is a roll of the dice, but I think with settlements, I always tell people, at least you know what you're getting. Sure. Uh, final. Okay, I said one more. One yep, more. No. What, uh, if you, if I'm a taxpayer watching here on Beck TV, what should I be watching for over the next year in in this particular situation? That all right? Well, I'm going to be on the hook for this. What should they be weary of? I think one thing to to keep an eye out for is whether he actually makes it all the way to the end, right? Um, he's supposed to step down in December, I think, 2022. Is that is that really how long he's going to be on there? Is he really going to be a tenured professor there? Or is this all kind of just, you know, dressing things up until maybe he's going to go get a job somewhere else? We, we don't know that. So that's one thing I keep an eye out for. And also, we're, details are going to be leaking out here. And I think we're going to learn a lot more in the weeks to come exactly how we got to this point. Well, some of that's going to be coming up next. Right here <laughs> well, that's good. Ross, I appreciate you taking time, man. All right, thank you. Uh, Ross Nielsen with uh, Nielsen Brown Law Firm right here in Fargo. Folks, it, it's been 12 years or will be 12 years for Dean Brashani's term. How did we get here? I'll tell you next right here on Down the Road. Folks, it's a Catalan Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at our salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Catalan burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Hi, Hunter Ellis here for Night Hero Binoculars by Atomic Beam. These binoculars let you see anything, even in pitch black darkness. Gotcha. The secrets are powerful wide angle atomic beam laser that reveals objects up to 150 yards away hidden by darkness. During the day, Night Hero gives you 10 times magnification. And when the sun goes down, press the Night Bright button to see clearly in the dark. Light up garbage eating critters or spot thieves before they even get close. Call or click now and get Night Hero binoculars for just $39.99. Order right now and you can double it. Plus, get our best selling atomic beam flashlight. Just pay a separate fee. We'll even ship them to you free. This TV special offer is not available on Amazon. You can get it all, but you have to order now. Call 1-800-619-1091. That's 1-800-619-1091. Or visit ByNightHero.com. That's ByNightHero.com. Order now. Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury? After taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked Elmiron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call Elmiron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680. 
Non attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1 800 230 9210. Well, welcome back to Down the Road. Tyler Axon is filling in for Joel Heitkamp yet again today. I appreciate you hanging around for the ride here. You know what? It's been a bumpy ride over the last uh, 24 hours since I last joined you uh, when it comes to the higher education in North Dakota. I mean, there's been drama in higher education across the state for years. This isn't something new. I think yesterday's announcement from the Board of Higher Education that longtime NDSU President Dean Bershani will be, quote, stepping down uh, sometime in 2022, caught some people off guard. I can tell you I wasn't one of them, and I'm going to get into that uh, over the next couple of minutes here because there's a couple of angles here. You've got the performance, and then you've got the politics, and then you've got the personality. All of that has come now to a head, and now the public's finally finding out about some of it, and over the course of the next few days, weeks, months, perhaps over the next year, you're going to find out even more. And you're going to hear some names that continue to pop up when it comes to particular to the State Board of Higher Education and the legislature uh, about their interactions with Dean Bershani and some of the tensions between them. And there has been some over the course of a long time. I know because it was uh, out there when I was in the state Senate. People just inherently didn't like NDSU for whatever reason at that time. But I want to just start off by what happened yesterday and the reasoning provided in the evaluation from the State Board of Higher Education to Dean Bershani's performance. We'll start performance, then we'll talk politics on this and the personalities that are involved. When Dean Bershani started at NDSU about 11 years ago, uh, you know what? We had a budget situation. There was people upset with Joe Chapman, former president, about what they were doing to expand the college. Well, with that, yes, you take investment, but you also had enrollment, and that enrollment continued to rise, which meant you needed a little bit more money. I remember coming down to Fargo to go to NDSU, and there was freshmen that were asked to live in hotels because the capacity wasn't there to stay on campus as required by NDSU for freshmen. So in comes Dean Bershani, and he tried to mitigate some of that, address it. And I would have to say in those early years, was quite successful, in my opinion. Now, you fast forward over the last, you know, four or five years, and things have started to dip. You heard the president and Dean Bershani, soon to be former president, say, look, I've got a goal to get enrollment to 18,000 students at NDSU. Pretty lofty. It raised a lot of eyes at that time, saying, whoa, okay. I mean, we're trending upwards. We're at about 14,000, 15,000 at the time, so maybe uh, that is doable. And with that came building and became investments, some of which are owned by lawmakers around NDSU's campus. And we'll get into more on that later. But we never got to that 18,000 goal. In fact, we started trending the other way before the pandemic. Yes, this COVID-19 impacted how higher education did, in fact, do its job. But this trend downward in enrollment at NDSU happened before that. And in fact, I think we are down to about 13,000 uh, down from our peak of about almost 15. So that trend is number one. Uh, number two, as far as performance goes, according to the evaluation that was handed down from the Board of Higher Education, part of that performance enhancement plan you just heard my for, uh, previous guests bring up from uh, you know, Ross Nielsen, Nielsen Brand Law Firm, was research needs to be looked into as well. It's a research university at uh, North Dakota State University. And you know what? There's rankings nationally that come along with that. And NDSU was sitting okay. It was, I think out of the nation, it was about 128 ranked as far as research, research goes. Well, over the last few years, our ranking has dropped. So there's another one when it comes to performance in which you're not really meeting the goals that were set uh, with this Board of Higher Education, this performance enhancement. You've got other things. You've got the diversity when it comes to faculty and students. And it turns out that some of those concerns addressed from students, from faculty, weren't exactly met by the president and Dean Bershani. And uh, that some of it just kind of hung around in the background until the media found out. 
again, performance. You didn't meet the, the standards at that time. You've got technology. You've got a whole gamut of things that the Board of Higher Education said, performance-wise, we had a plan. You didn't get to where we wanted to be now. So here is a way for you to transition out. But I got to tell you, it's not just about performance, ladies and gentlemen. There are politics, there are personalities that also play into why Dean Bershani is on his way out as president of North Dakota State University. Now, it's no secret Dean Bershani has been a very avid supporter of Republican politics. And you know what? To each their own. That is his right to do so. If you've been to an NDSU football game at home, you've probably heard the announcements routinely given at one of those timeouts as far as a special guest to President Dean Bershani is... One of the three following. It's typically Jim Roars, a state senator from Fargo who has a lot of development around NDSU. It's typically Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, who, of course, is an alum of NDSU, or it's, state Sen or it's United States Senator, pardon me, uh, John Hoven. So circling with some of those very influential individuals in North Dakota politics, and what did it get you? Not a whole lot. You're on the outside looking in, and that that working around trying to make sure that you're pals with the right people, I don't know if it distracted from the goal of enhancing that research capacity because when you, they needed you out in Bismarck to push back on some of those friends that you've been cuddling up with over the last few years in Republican politics right here in North Dakota because you didn't want to upset them. When Yana Myrdal and she grab, gabbed a, a number of allies in this particular session to push back on research at North Dakota State University, albeit with a partner grant that she didn't like, Dean Bershani wasn't out there to defend the research and the researcher who has now since left North Dakota, left NDSU to continue that free academic research elsewhere in a state and probably a university that would step up and defend that faculty and that researcher. I don't know why the politics got in the way of that, but that impedes the whole academic freedom of a research university. Performance, politics, and there's internal politics at NDSU as well. The faculty has their own governing system, and what I think really was the catalyst to push this towards its final conclusion, that Dean Bershani is no longer the right fit at NDSU on this role, was when the state or the faculty senate came out and censured Dean Bershotti. It's a long story. I'll try to keep it short for you. You have got internal governance at universities. And there are rules and there are policies and procedures, much like any other place of employment that you're supposed to follow. And when a place uh, was looking to uh, uh, fill a void in a provost at NDSU, there is a nationwide search committee. There are procedures that are set up to make this work to remove any personal uh, ability saying, you know what, I like this individual. I think if I, if I get that person, they're going to do exactly what I want them to do. From the outside looking in, that appears was exactly what happened at NDSU. We had a national search committee take place. There were candidates, five selected out of the 100 plus that applied. There was interviews. There was a process. And none of them got the job because Dean Bershani selected, handpicked someone else that was an intern that never applied for that, never went through the process, but is familiar with NDSU, said, she's my person. And faculty were upset about that, and I understand why. They censured him because of that, because that individual then became the permanent provost. And the faculty was not thrilled because there are policies and procedures, and they felt that the president was stepping all over them and their right in governing how they operate at NDSU. So now you've lost the faith of the faculty of which you are in charge of. So we have the internal dynamics. You've got the State Board of Higher Education dynamics, which you knew they were going to be taking this step because over the weekend, phone calls were made, ladies and gentlemen. And they were made to donors of NDSU, and they were made to lawmakers trying to get them to rally in support of Dean Prashani, according to reports that you're going to find probably surface later on. Going around the board, I think, was the final straw. And the ultimate six to one vote didn't surprise me. Dean Bershani and I had a great working relationship when I was in the state Senate, but times have changed, and I'm not surprised whatsoever in this ultimate decision. But I do hope the best for NDSU, those students and that faculty going forward, because you know what? It's a great institution. 
It's a great research facility, and you know what? There's a bright future ahead. It's not just athletics, ladies and gentlemen. That academic side also is something to be proud of in the state of North Dakota. In fact, we're all paying for it. So we need to get a leader there that's going to be looking up for that side as well. All right. You know what? That's going to be a story to continue on, and I'll bring you through that later on as well. But we're talking game and fish, pheasants, deer, where are the numbers, how are we going? We'll talk about that next with North Dakota Game and Fish. I'm Doug Billings, your host of The Right Side with Doug Billings on Beck News. We bring you high profile guests, ladies and gentlemen, exclusive guests. Now, you're not going to see these guests in most of the mainstream media outlets. Another thing that I do here is give guests a platform to speak freely. You're not going to see me censor anybody. Please join us, won't you? Weeknights right here on Beck TV and online at Beck.News. Cheers. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream sheets. When you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Introducing the Cool Turtle, the ultra comfortable mask enhancer that creates a protective, cool, and breathable space between your mask and your face. Simply slide under any mask or gaiter and immediately feel the refreshing pocket of air surrounding your face. Cool Turtle's ergonomically designed soft, comfortable shell immediately reduces mask friction, allowing you to breathe and talk in a comfortable environment. I can actually breathe. With the Cool Turtle, no more sweating. It's like I don't even have a mask on. Call now and get not one, not two, but three cool turtles for just $10. Order now and we'll send you two more cool turtles free. No fees, absolutely free. Plus, you can get a 10-pack of four-ply face masks. Just pay a separate fee. This offer is not available on Amazon. Get the real cool turtle now. Call 1-800-270-1219. That's 1-800-270-1219. Or visit at coolturtle.com. Order now. <laughs> We're the ladies of Another View, bringing you a fresh view on local issues. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Oh my gosh. Isn't that, that the most condescending, crazy. rude email you've ever on received? Well, welcome to National the third News. term of a certain president. I really believe that. And different perspectives you won't get on the mainstream media. Watch us weekday afternoons at 4.30 Central Time on Beck News and at Beck.News. Hey Bucks fans, if you're planning an outing, birthday, or employee appreciation night, then bring your group out to the Buck Stop for a night of fast-paced, high-scoring football. Your group will receive discounted tickets, options for reserved seating, scoreboard messages, VIP services, swag, and a space to gather during the game. You can also participate in pre-game ceremonies, halftime entertainment, in-game contests, and more. Call 701-595-0771 or visit bismarckbucks.com forward slash tickets. All GA is first come, first serve. We'll see you on the turf. Go Bucks! Welcome back to Down the Road. Tyler Axon is taking you on this stretch here on a Wednesday evening. I appreciate you sticking around here on Beck T. You know what? A uh, number of things going on. Obviously, we've got this drought, which we will get into a little bit more on the agricultural side with Rusty Halverson. He is an ag reporter uh, with KFGO Radio out of Fargo, North Dakota. And you know what? He's been all over the state watching as uh, people are trying to find ways to mitigate the impacts of this drought. And it's not just agriculture, as you're well aware. We've got cattle, we've got our ranchers that are struggling as well, but also wildlife and what that means to deer hunting, what that means in particular to pheasant hunting as well. I want to get into the deer a little bit later on, but pheasant numbers across the state of North Dakota, we've seen an uptick as far as what you are finding out there. But with this drought and the impact, I'm curious what that might mean for a fall hunt. Here to talk a little bit about that is going to be North Dakota Game and Fish. Jesse Kohler is going to be joining us to explain the numbers, where they are, what the drought might mean going forward. Uh, because it's dry out there and that habitat, uh, the environment, all of that uh, does have an impact going forward. And I got to tell you, I was up in uh, the northeastern part of the state just the other weekend. And you've got 
uh, places in which I haven't seen pheasants in a very long time, and I saw them uh, for the first time, and it was encouraging. So here to explain some of that and what that might mean as far as you going out and finding those pheasants to hunt is North Dakota Game and Fish Jesse Kohler, who's joining us right now. Jesse, how are you doing, man? Really well. Sorry for, for not getting on sooner. No, that I is... I trouble my microphone on my computer. With... <laughs> Technology's a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm on my phone now, so I hope well, you let's, can see and hear me. Well, I can hear you perfectly loud and clear. Same with the audience here. Let's talk pheasants. And I, I will get into the deer. Yep. I know there's people that were upset, which is every time you apply for a deer application, doesn't mean you're exactly going to get drawn. I was lucky. I was fortunate to get one. But people are thinking pheasants. Saw a report earlier from Game & Fish that... Numbers are looking like they're up from last year. Is there much concern about this drought and what that might mean for a fall hunt, Jesse? Yeah, so the numbers that are up are our spring census, which is our adult population, those that, that survived from last year, which being up most of the state is, is a result of having a mild winter and pretty good conditions throughout the spring. They were down in the southwest, so in, in the one region in the southwest where we have most of our pheasants, they were down. So. Um, that was somewhat surprising. We had good reproduction and a mild winter. Uh, we're not sure why why the numbers aren't aren't better there. Um, and then for how that will project into our fall, you know, the the adult population is basically our principal for our. If we're talking money, it would be the principal for a loan. And the crazy thing is that we can have an interest rate or a reproduction rate of anywhere from negative to to 400 percent so very variable depending on weather and the drought is gonna gonna impact that um, right now across the state it's it's variable so the southwest is actually greener than than a lot of other areas in the state right now and it looks good i'm in dickinson here and, and things are are green there's not a lot of standing water which which is always a concern for everyone but but for pheasants there's cover and there are insects out there for for chicks to be eating when the when they start to hatch um the the, the next thing we're going to be watching for is you know a pheasant's nest and each hen has has two or three nesting attempts the first attempt is her big gamble she'll put all her eggs you know up to 12 or more eggs in one nest in that first attempt if those get predated by a skunk or badger or whatever the second nest she'll lay again and might only lay seven, eight eggs. And then if she tries a third time, it would be even smaller yet. So so we really count on the early nesting for the bulk of our production, but most of these hens aren't successful the first time. So if they're not getting enough water in their diet, that second nesting attempt, they'll have much fewer eggs. They just can't produce the eggs or, or might not nest at all. Well, and the, the water situation, I think, is, you know, a concern for a, a number of issues here. But and, you know, as far as this trend goes, because I remember a few years ago, people said, geez, you just don't see the pheasants sell like you used to. And then it seems over the last handful of years, I've been noticing more when I'm taking my country cruises, whether it's up in the Devil's Lake Basin or even uh, down south of, uh, you know, the Fargo-Moorhead area, West Fargo, where I call home now. You, you notice them a little bit more, which is encouraging. Uh, but, you know, what I'm hearing uh, from farmers out in the, the Hazen area that, you know, it's, our wheat has already sprouted and uh, it's, you know, probably about the size of a water bottle. And you can see, you know, a prairie dog run, a, you know, quarter away across the, the field. That's concerning as far as some of that habitat goes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the fields, you know, they're not ideal nesting habitat for pheasants, so they're not going to nest in yeah. agriculture fields very often, but it is important um, for, the, for the broods. The broods love, you know, especially canola fields and some of the fields that have flowers. You know, it's wide open underneath, so those chicks are able to move around freely. They still have cover from, from predators and, and the ones that have flowers, canola and flax particularly. You know, there's a lot of a lot of insect production coming on on those those fields. So, so definitely some of the stunted crops this year could be could be limiting for how how much habitat is there for broods. So I guess kind of my final question for you before I let you go uh, uh, this evening is, uh, I mean, it, you got your crystal ball there. You're looking into the the upcoming hunt. Uh, are you gonna have a successful hunt, or is it just kind of? kind of murky right now just because you know what we haven't broken this drought and i'm looking at the forecast for at least the next couple of weeks she's gonna be hot and not much more precipitation across the state if you could predict what people are going to expect i want to hear it from you jesse 
Yeah, I, I think 60% of the harvest is are going to be those chicks, so that's still undetermined. Um, the, the adults that are there now, I don't think we're having severe enough hail to where they're, they're, we're not losing adults. So I think we're going to be about the same as last year at least. Um, pending pending areas that get precipitation or not, areas that get precipitation, I think they'll see a slight bump up average, average production, and areas that remain in the drought, they're probably going to see little to no... Um, noticeable increase, so so probably be really similar or, or slightly down from last year if they're okay. not seeing those juveniles. All right, well, Jesse, there's some information for you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you taking time. I know how busy things are. I need to stay safe on Dickinson. Have a happy Fourth of July, all right? Thank you. You too. I appreciate that. Uh, Jesse Collier is with uh, North Dakota Game and Fish, uh, folks. The, you know, pheasants also uh, one of those things that lucky lucky enough to have one recommend uh, wrapping it in bacon. There's a whole other thing that I would uh, encourage you to do as far as once you uh, harvest that. But I know a lot of you have also applied for deer tags. Depending on where you're at, I was fortunate. I know a number of people that for uh, the first time in a while, they've actually got their tag. They were lucky. They won the lottery, so to speak. Uh, and I'm happy for them because Game of Fish has done, I think, a good job of getting that population built back up. There are some people that, you know what, found them on the outside looking in. Well, there's some good news. You can go to Game & Fish uh, website, and there are some tags still available. If you want, go out there. You can find some of the units that are still offering uh, some of those going forward. Because I understand uh, North Dakota deer hunting is one of those un uh, unofficial holidays. First, you get to the application results, and everyone scurries online to see, okay, was I successful? Was it antlered? Was it antlerless? Mine was antler list, but you know what? I'll live because at least I get to get out there and enjoy that uh, and what North Dakota has to offer. So you have that as that official unwrapping of the present, so to speak, and then you've got the day itself coming up in November. So I get it. It's important for those of you that want to get out there. If you unwrapped an empty present, you didn't get drawn, there's more opportunities to dive back in, and maybe you're going to be lucky on this next go-around. So go to North Dakota's Game and Fish website and... Uh, see if you can't find a spot that's near you. Make a trip out of it because you know what? There's deer out there, and some of them certainly need to be harvested. You know, uh, part of that conversation when it comes to the drought, how that impacts the pheasants, what that's going to do for your harvest as well, how do you mitigate it? That's a question I'm going to be asking Rusty Halverson next as he joins me here in studio because it's dry out there. There's programs available for you, national, state, neighbors helping neighbors. He's going to break some of that down for us next right here on Down the Road. Stick around. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. My Giza sheets also include full 21 inch wide pillowcases that will fit over any pillow and deep pocket sheets that will fit over any mattress. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets. Giza Dream Sheets are available in a variety of colors. Use your promo code and for a limited time, when you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Not attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1-800-230-9210. Seniors, are you aware that you could pay less for your car insurance? Seniors can save money on their car insurance. You might save a little, you might save a lot. Maybe hundreds of dollars a year. You might save 5% a year, maybe 10%, 15%, or even more. That's a lot of money. So call right now and find out just how much money you might be able to save. 1-800-699-0761. one 800 699 
Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Well, thanks for joining us as we continue to drive on down the road. Joel Heitkamp out on Tyler Axon is filling in for him. He'll be back in just a day or two, uh, I'm sure, enjoying his 4th of July celebrations. But I'm happy to be with you uh, this evening yet again. Yesterday, we did spend a long time talking about some of the drought conditions, what that means for your Independence Day celebrations, fireworks, all the safety that you need to take into account if you are out there enjoying, which I hope you do. It's going to be a beautiful weekend across the state of North Dakota. But we can't neglect the fact that it's been dry. And it hasn't just been dry this spring or this summer. It's been dry for a very long time. We had a very mild winter. And you know what? I know that there's farmers that got in the field early because of that mild conditions. And we're hoping that maybe that moisture would catch up. And unfortunately, it hasn't quite gotten there yet. And with some of that, I'd mentioned in the last segment that we've had some farmers talk about their wheat's already sprouting. I've seen some corn in some parts of the state already up to about your midsection, well past that knee high by 4th of July. But I've also seen in other parts of the state where it's about mid-calf high. So it's a wide variety out there. It's dry. And you know that, especially if you're out as one of those agricultural producers or if you're a rancher. But there are some ways of which there are assistance available. And when I think about ways of which to get that information out to people that need it, I think about a couple of people. I think about Sarah Heinrich and I think about Rusty Halverson, both part of a fantastic farm and ranch team. On radio out here on the eastern side of the state, KFGO, where I also have a radio show, Rusty Halverson joins me right now on Beck TV to break down some of what's out there. Rusty, I appreciate you making the hop, skip, and jump over to join yeah, me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tyler. Well, uh, you know... We have the same conversation, it feels, about every other day because the situation hasn't changed a lot. It hasn't gotten a lot better. Correct. Um, but there has been improvements, I think, about what might be available for farmers and ranchers when it comes to drought. I mean, you've been traveling the state as well as I have, and you know how dry it is out yep, there. Yep, yep, absolutely. absolutely. So um, let's start at the top, federally, okay, and then we'll work our way down because I know there's some unique ways of which farmers and ranchers are pairing up to try to mitigate some of the impacts they're having. Mm -hmm. Uh, but remind those that are watching as far as federal assistance, what they could be looking for with the, uh, specifically the drought situation. Well, uh, producers are probably well aware already, um, and you and I have talked about uh, several times, there are some federal assistance programs administered through the FSA, and uh, your local county FSA office will be able to help you, USDA Service Center. And uh, one of those would be the Livestock Forage Program, compensation for uh, lost production on rangeland or pasture land. There's also ELAP, the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program. That kind of is a catch-all for losses that aren't covered by LFP or by uh, the Livestock Indemnity Program. Um, so those are a couple of programs that producers can always reach out about too. And another thing that we've had uh, is emergency hanging and grazing for CRP land. Now, uh, there are some caveats with that. Um, uh, you know, for North Dakota, uh, 50 of the 53 counties, I do believe, are eligible for it. But one thing that we've got, Tyler, of course, is the nesting season. You just got done talking about pheasants. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to hanging those CRP acres, normally we would have the nesting season you would remain untouched and you could not hay those acres until August 1st. One thing that the North Dakota Congressional Delegation and Ag Commissioner Doug Goring are trying to persuade federal officials is to perhaps move up that date for hang of CRP to July 15th. The nesting season in Montana and Wyoming, that ends July 15th, but in North Dakota and South Dakota and Minnesota too, I believe, that's August 1st. So if we could just move that forward a couple of weeks, that might give us 
a little bit more opportunity because when it comes to grazing CRP, a lot of that land, Tyler, there's there's not a fence around it. You can't just drop right. off animals. Yeah, it's on it's on a right of way most of the time. It's yeah, right there. So I mean, I'm driving by it with my truck. At exactly. Times, yeah. So that's one obstacle to grazing of CRP land. Another would be: is there a source of water on that land for livestock, or would you have to haul water to it? And so on the federal level, that's kind of what we're looking at. And again, state officials and uh, the congressional delegation trying to bump up that earlier uh, hang date uh, for CRP. And we'll just have to stand by and see what word comes down. Yeah, the and, and you mentioned 53 or 50 of the 53. And I, I believe it's the southeast corner, that Richland County yeah. Ransom Sergeant. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know that we've ever, well, I haven't looked into it, but why those three saying, ah, everybody but you? Yeah. Uh, so for our Richland viewers, uh, sorry about that. Well, but. my sources down there say it, it looks pretty good for some oh. of the crops. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I forget that they had a little bit more moisture than yes, other they did. Oh, yes, okay, well, I retract. Yes, but, uh, yeah. uh, the the federal delegation, I, I believe, is Senator John Olvin today and mm -hmm. tomorrow or whatever the timeline Correct. is, is in fact going and doing some tours of the drought as well. Yeah, he has the uh, the top dogs from the RMA and the FSA, uh, Risk Management Agency and Farm Service Agency, and he is giving them a first-hand look so they can see the drought condition, uh, conditions for themselves. They're making stops in Mandan and Minot today. It'll be Carrington and Argusville tomorrow. And we probably don't really expect any announcements or anything sure. out of this visit, but having those guys from Washington, D.C. in the area, being able to see it firsthand, hearing from producers firsthand, that goes a long way to maybe convincing them to make some of these decisions when it comes to CRP, haying early, and also for the RMA when it comes to our crops out there and crop insurance. Uh, you, you spoke earlier about uh, wheat that's headed out and mm -hmm. it's only as big as a bottle of water. Okay, well, if we're not going to harvest that wheat, we talk to our crop insurance agent and take a loss on that acreage. But a lot of producers would like to have that de declaration earlier rather than later so they can use that acreage perhaps for another use, such as maybe growing sorghum or maybe growing millet, a forage crop something to keep that soil in place sure and also uh, you know perhaps to raise a forage on it um, there's some different little facets to that too on when you would be able to graze it or hay that but also if you're going to maybe hay or uh, you know graze uh, barley or durham out in the western part of the state too um, that might be an option but again you've got to have your crop insurance agent mm -hmm. on board and the risk management agency crop insurance is a public private partnership right and so whatever the private guys locally declare for their adjustment on that crop the federal guys have to agree and uh, ag commissioner doug goring has worked with rma administrators in the past and during disasters such as 2017 that we have a little bit more leeway and more understanding on what's going on so again having the head of rma certainly doesn't help uh, well, and you bring talk about you know keeping that soil where it is. I mean, because of this drought, because of the strong winds we've had, at least on the in the valley here. I'm not sure about elsewhere in the state. We've seen some of that soil end up. Uh, we've seen property change hands, so to speak. We've yeah. seen uh, whether it was in a ditch or someone else's field. So it's important to find ways to keep that where it is. Yeah. So federally, they've got people here on the ground statewide. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned that Commissioner Doug Goring has been in talks with some of this in the past. Yep. State programs, I know that uh, they've declared some emergencies as far as statewide goes. Yep. What can people look at on that level? Uh, the governor and Commissioner Goring not too long ago uh, reactivated what's known, I got to check my notes, the Drought Disaster Livestock Water Supply Project Assistance Program. And that's a program that uh, producers may be familiar with in the past. They have reactivated it and that is more of a cost sharing program if you have to drill a new well or tap something in a pasture or extend pipeline or anything like that uh, it's an up to uh, 50 percent up to forty five hundred dollars per project i believe um, you want to talk to the state water commission about it but uh, they'll help cost share for some of that work that if you can do that to uh, help get some stock water supply to your livestock that would help too one thing uh, uh there's I think that being a part of the upper Midwest, and I think this may be more rural, and I, I know there's people in some of the metros watching as well, but, you know, uh, you see your neighbor needing help with something. There's been some of that going on. You and I talked uh, earlier this week on, on radio about, look, this, this crop over here, I mean, is there a way of which if you don't have the grazing over there, the pasture's not growing much, I've got this crop, it's not real well, an opportunity for some of that cattle to maybe be 
utilized on that field. I mean, some of that store stuff is going on, Rusty. Yeah, again, you, you need a, some kind of a string around it so yeah. you can turn them loose, mm -hmm. obviously. But uh, as we mentioned, uh, when it comes to either hanging or grazing small grains, um, that's an option. A lot of guys are looking at that. One thing you have to keep in mind, though, when you're feeding that would be nitrate levels because, yeah, um, yeah uh, you don't want to make your livestock sick or potentially. And poisoning. Yeah. yeah, poison, potentially death. Um, so you can always talk to your county extension folks about that for nitrate grazing. Talk to your local vet. They might be able to point you in the right direction, too. Um, but just uh, the thoughts on everybody's mind, helping neighbors. Yeah. I talked to a crop guy up by Wolford, North Dakota. He's a, a big soybean producer, and uh, he also has small grains. But uh, the small grains weren't looking so good last time I talked to him. Soybeans still have a chance. But at those small grains, he was thinking, okay, for the low spots where I do have something, maybe I can cut that. Maybe I can help out, uh, you know, some guys in the area. Because mm -hmm. as the drought map showed, uh, from about Hazen up to Towner, over towards Minot, that's deep, deep, dark red maroon. That's bad, bad. It and is. that's in the heart of cattle country, yeah. too. Final question. I've only got 30 seconds. And I, <laughs> this is such a, a heavy question. Um, so it's going to have to be probably a one-word answer. Okay. Wasn't really around in the 80s. Okay. Uh, born in 86. So I don't, okay. I, I mean, I know of the conditions back then compared to what we're going through right now. I mean, 80s worse is this, uh, I've heard some people say, look, this is the worst I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, you, you live through it. I'm just curious to, is, do, do you consider this situation more dire or more extreme than what we, we survived through in the 80s? I would call it uh, on the potential, the brink of being more extreme. Okay. Yep. Well, on that happy note. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's what I'm hearing out there is, look, this is the worst I've seen. Yep. That's why it's important that you share those those programs with people. Yep, absolutely. Rusty, I appreciate it. I'll see you on the radio, all Thank right? Thank you, Tyler. Rusty Halverson, uh, great work, uh, and he's out there on the beaten path of many of you uh, helping you out. In fact, I'd encourage you to go check out more of his work online. Folks, when we come back, i got to talk, and I'm going to be speaking to educators of what we need from you next right here in North Dakota. Do you worry about going to the dentist? After all, a visit to the dentist can easily cost $2,000 or more. Well, relax. The Carefree Dental Card is now available in your area. Call now and we'll send your actual card at no cost today. With the Carefree Dental Card, you go to the dentist whenever you need and you instantly pay a lot less. Activate your card and you can start using it immediately. From exams and cleanings to more expensive procedures like crowns, dentures, even braces, they're all included with the Carefree Dental Card. Say you go to the dentist today without any card and your bill is, well, ouch. Wait a minute, let's try that again. You go to the dentist today and show your Carefree Dental Card, you save $525. The Carefree Dental Card is just $15.95 a month, so call now and make going to the dentist carefree. Call 1-800-416-5739 to receive your Carefree Dental Card Information Kit. 1-800-416-5739. Call now. I can't say enough good things about these nano hearing aids. Real people talking about nano hearing aids. The hearing quality is great. Until now, hearing aids used to be too expensive for the average person. Until nano. Call now and you'll get your nano hearing aids for only $297. You'll save $100. When you buy one hearing aid, nano will give you a second hearing aid free. Call right now. 1-800-213-3815. Spas, etc. Yeah, yeah. You've come to know and trust us for over 18 years with the largest selection and showroom in Western North Dakota for our beautiful Sundance spas. Plus, you can pick out your next home experience with our selection of pool tables, shuffle boards, and fun accessories. Spas, etc. Your relaxation destination on Maiden and Bismarck. Who do you trust with your digital life? Not all cloud backup providers keep your data truly private. Beck Cloud Backup uses advanced multi-layer encryption to keep your family photos, videos, and sensitive business documents secure and only for your eyes. Your Beck Lightband Internet service already includes 50 gigs of free storage to keep your digital life safe and secure. Call us at 701-475-2361 to start using your Beck Cloud Backup today. Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury, after taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? 
In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked l -Myron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call l Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680. Final stretch of down the road here. I'm Tyler Axis taking you on into your evening Beck lineup. Joel Heidkamp will be back in the coming days here. And folks, I just got to be upfront with you. We made the request. We asked. We asked the superintendents. We asked teachers, those that represent them, to come on and speak to something you probably heard about and you probably shout about uh, that this shouldn't happen. A critical race theory. Not being taught in North Dakota, but you know what? It doesn't mean as much coming from me as just a TV talk show host and radio personality. It needs to come from superintendents. It needs to come from teachers. To hear that they were not willing to come out and speak on this, to set the record straight, to tell you the truth, does everyone a disservice. It's part of their responsibility and the public education system to go out there and educate not only the students in their care, but the public about what is in fact going on and what is not going on in the school system. So I plead with you as teachers, I plead with you as superintendents and those involved in public education. If you know that there's misinformation or there's just outright lies going on about what is not being taught in schools, you've got to speak up. You've got to be willing to come in front of a camera or behind a microphone and tell the public the truth that this is not taking place in North Dakota. The outrage that is manufactured over something that's not taking place needs to be addressed. And it needs to be addressed by those in authority and with, quite frankly, the leadership of public education. I understand it's not easy to come out there because people are emotional about this topic. They've been fueled by this, uh, this outrage nationally and now you're seeing it locally you're seeing recalls take place of school board members with critical race theory as part of the reason folks it's not being taught in north dakota i understand you're going to be pounding your table right now if you in fact are saying this is a big issue in north dakota it is not it would have a hell of a lot more weight coming from a teacher or from an educator or from a superintendent to tell you that but unfortunately as i just got done telling you they weren't willing to come on and speak to you about it i hope that changes in the days and weeks ahead because it's doing everyone a disservice with their absence. Folks, that's it for me. I'm Tyler Axtonis. Enjoy your 4th of July celebration safely. Till next time, you take care of yourselves.